Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of metaphysics. Hey everyone, my name is AJ and welcome back to Philosophy Battle. Actually, this is going to be the final video I'm doing on philosopher Paulo O'Grady's book called Relativism. After doing an entire series, pretty much a video on each chapter plus more too, accidentally. Like, I didn't really plan to do that. Anyway, if you want to watch the entire series from the beginning, you can. I'll put the playlist link here. But whether you've missed some or only watched a few or haven't watched any at all, like, hey, don't worry about it. I got you. It's all good. I'll be giving a recap of what happened in the book anyway. This video is actually part of a series I'm doing investigating relativism because it's an important issue if we want to know what counts as science. I mean, think about it. If everything is just relative, then even religious extremists could start teaching from their holy texts and just call it science in order to teach their religious beliefs in the science classroom because, hey, everything is relative. Well, listen, I'm fine with my kids learning about different people's religions. I'm not here to preach about religions being bad or wrong or anything like that. If you love that stuff, great, awesome. But I just think we should learn about them maybe in like religious classes or other places, but not in science class. So I need to be able to say if something is or is not science. And it's really important to how our society functions for many other reasons too. Like in business, you know, making money. If you're investing in some product, you kind of want to know if it's actually based on scientific research or not. Or in politics, we want to know whose position actually coheres with science and actual data. In healthcare, you know, being anti-science can even lead to massive death. And even the very future of our species can be impacted when it comes to our environment and what counts as scientific evidence there. So there's got to be some limit to relativism. And in this way of framing it, maybe the very future of our species depends on it. So that's why I came here to the battlefield of metaphysics, then to really investigate relativism as a philosophic weapon to see how powerful it can be, but also where its limits are. So when I first got here, I did a short series on this red book of Robert Kirk taking on the true for me relativist or the Protagorean relativist if you fancy, but then moved on to bigger, badder, more sophisticated relativist covered in this green book. And this is the final video of that series or sort of final. So I'm going to give a recap of what happened in this book throughout each of the chapters, but I won't be explaining in depth any of the philosophical concepts, so you can check them out if you want to. But in this video, I'm just kind of reporting what happened in the book and how the arguments went in the book according to O'Grady. So it's probably not a great place for you to respond to the arguments here, but just think of those other videos as a kind of optional quest if you want some background information. After that, I will be covering very minimally what O'Grady says in his final concluding chapter, Evaluating Relativism. In a separate video after that, then I'll actually be giving a kind of criticism I have of O'Grady, which has three important components. Now the third component will lead me into explaining another criticism of mine about what I feel is missing from his book and about the powers of the philosophic eye which will lead us well into a discussion with Patrick J.J. Phillips' book, this blue book that I wanted to cover, RGB. So please do stick around for that next video and check it out if you do want to hear what my criticism of O'Grady is and to talk about this philosophic eye which I've been promising in my whole video series here. But for now, let's look at Paul o. O'Grady and cover what happened in his book. Paul O'Grady is a lecturer in philosophy at Trinity College in Dublin at the time of publishing this book called Relativism. Now there are many books on relativism by various philosophers, however this one happens to be very early in the 21st century and I want to explain why I chose this one. Basically in his book he has four cognitive areas where he investigates relativism, not things like morality or ethics or art or you know you feel things a certain way but actual things like truth and knowledge and facts. These chapters go 2, 3, 4, 5. Or there could be five areas if we include logic under two, which was included in the second chapter. And among these there are two areas where he defends against relativism while he allows it here and here, but here to a limited degree. Or so he seems to want to present himself this way as if that's what happened. But really the first and foremost thing is his explanation of why we must avoid contradiction always. This is what we call the principle of non-contradiction. And it's actually the very heart of this book, the organ you could say. 
and it's really the reason why I selected it. Many other philosophers explain why we must avoid contradiction. Some philosophers may just say it's directly evident that it's not the case that P and not P at the same time. So like it just cannot be true that the ball is black all over and not black all over at the exact same time, same place, same everything. That contradictions are direct evidence for something being false. If something's contradictory, well then it just can't be. But for O'Grady, there's a better explanation. You see, it's important to note first though maybe that despite relativists perhaps wishing to incorrectly accuse anyone who's steadfast on the principle of non-contradiction as erecting some kind of universal transcendental principle as if one is attempting to speak with an objective language in line of a failed history of a more traditional philosopher, that's actually really not what's happening here. In fact, that would be a derogatory misleading mischaracterization, possibly by somebody unwilling to actually engage with the arguments O'Grady is offering here, just to be maybe dogmatically supportive of relativism to the nth degree. However, O'Grady's argument, though it's not even unique to him maybe, I personally just really like the way he wrote it for us, of why we must avoid contradiction. It actually does have to do with our debate and discussion, it has to do with our ability to communicate and connect with each other. So his argument for the principle of non-contradiction is not based on some kind of rational intuition or an assumption about the metaphysical nature of reality beyond perception or cognitive access which is stereotypically what the relativist might accuse someone of doing. But that's not what's going on here. So that kind of criticism would be a terrible mischaracterization. O'Grady's explanation is that the very nature of assertion, asserting anything at all, depends upon the principle of non-contradiction. It's about saying something, something of substance, the nature of assertion. Now what exactly was that argument about assertion and how does this work to depend on the principle of non-contradiction? Well, you can definitely go and check out that video if you'd like, but if you don't, don't worry, I'll be looking at this argument more specifically again when I give my kind of criticism of it, but that might be in another video. But I promise I will look at it even closer there than I have in that first video because I'm going to be giving a kind of detailed criticism of what's going on. So let's look now at what actually happened in each area of philosophy when it comes to Paulo Grady's investigation of relativism. So in the first area of the elithic relativist, that is the relativist about truth, they want it to be possible that both P and not P, where P means the same thing in both, can be considered both true at the same time, same place, same meaning. But to be clear, they are not denying the principle of non-contradiction. They know that contradictions are bad. So instead what they are trying to do is attempt to alter our concept of what truth means here so that it does not produce a contradiction. Three arguments were presented, all of which were rejected, and that was awesome and an amazing battle. It was really quite a wonderful video for people to watch. I got a lot of good comments about it, please do check it out. But after these arguments, we were kind of left with a non-relativized truth, or at least there may have been a better chance to relativize truth with different theories of truth. But of the different theories of truth, this one was rejected, this one didn't even relativize truth, it just kind of removed it, and this one is the epistemic theory of truth. It relies on how much relativism there is in epistemology then. And how much relativism there is in epistemology, well when we investigate in that chapter, it seems that it too is limited by core rationality. And such all of rationality is also similarly limited by core rationality, a universal conception presented in his chapter 5. As he describes it, he says, if truth is understood as an epistemic property and there is epistemological relativism, couldn't that lead back to alithic relativism? This depends on the extent of epistemological relativism admitted, which in turn depends on the extent of relativity and rationality one allows. In chapter 5 there will be an argument for core conception of rationality, which is universal and that governs localized conceptions of rationality, which is the kind of epistemological relativism admissible. Extreme versions of epistemological relativism will be rejected in chapter 4. Localized conceptions of rationality are alternative sets of epistemic rules, much like the examples from hacking of styles of reasoning. These local rationalities are governed by the core conception of rationality, and don't genuinely compete with each other. Therefore, if truth is construed on epistemic grounds, 
it will be the core conception of rationality that will constitute truth, and which will yield an absolute rather than relativist account of truth. So there's no avenue for truth where we can consider both P and not P in the same meaning of P, same time, same everything, where both can be considered true in moments of conscious deliberation, like during our consideration and careful thought and debate. So that's the structure of his book being mostly revealed here, but there are two more important connections to be made between the different areas. One is that in logic, while we can actually have different logics, even deviant ones that drop this principle, and like not just syntactically, but also for use in very specialized situations like in quantum physics, supposedly, well, those logics and situations are themselves still always governed and restricted by rationality above it that governs it, and in that rationality it still holds the principle of non-contradiction. As he says, our choice of logical systems is itself governed by a more general conception of rationality. Which notions of logic operate in such system? In chapter 5, I shall argue the law of non-contradiction holds here. Now the other important connection between areas is between ontology and epistemology, which I'd like to look at that chapter next. So in ontology, it's about what exists, the fundamental furniture of the world, the account of what the world is. But in that chapter, it seems as if the ontological relativists change the discussion from what is, what exists, independent of the mind, which they will regard as essentially meaningless, to a discussion about what we say there is. The anti-realists can respond to this by first asking what one can say about the reality underlying theory. How can we have cognitive access to the underlying reality? So according to the ontological relativist, the issue becomes less about what is, to more a discussion of what we have access to. And it's a criticism that is then credited to Devitt that this is a kind of conflation, or rather deflation, of ontology into epistemology from what is to what we're justified to know or say. This kind of conflation renders the discussion about the world or what even exists to be merely about that which is relative or constructed by our conceptual schemes. And about this, O'Grady seems to settle, saying, It may turn out to be a false doctrine, and the sophisticated realist may prevail. However, there clearly are significant arguments to be answered on part of the ontological relativist and it appears to be one of the best ways that those attracted to relativistic ideas can accommodate that relativism. And so that's the other relation, and I will explain how this other relation is actually spelled out in multiple ways, but not that we are, but if we are settling with what the ontological relativist says, then ontology begins to depend on epistemology. In epistemology then, we can have a lot of relativism, not just the things that everyone already kind of agrees, like the fact that people know different things because they're in different places, but even things like the laws of nature, or even things like geometry, or knowledge about our a priori frameworks, could in fact actually be different. These conceptual frameworks are kind of things, concepts, structures that we use as necessary to know anything at all. They are the necessary background concepts we use to comprehend the content of any kind when it comes to knowledge. But while these frameworks themselves can be very different, they actually can't be radically different from each other, or so he argues, that there's actually a shared core framework among all of them, which is his core rationality, and from which we can actually judge these different a priori frameworks we have. So then in chapter 5, this core rationality is presented with four principles. But I only care about the principle of non-contradiction. I mean, maybe one can open up avenues of discussion for virtue epistemology when it comes to principles for evidence or whatever, but I'm not doing that today. The principle of non-contradiction for me is the strongest case for universality of this core anyway, and I believe that's fair to say. In any case, when it comes to chapter 5, O'Grady took on many opponents, many relativists who want to claim that there is relative rationality. But his main move is that their arguments actually have to do with relativism and support relativism in other areas. They don't actually support relativism about rationality anyway. And while he is open to some relativism about local notions of rationality or even about expanding our understanding of rationality, Still, what he is doing is arguing for a minimal core of rationality that cuts through all. 
So that's the structure of his book and what we went through in all of these different videos. So let's look at his final chapter now and what he kind of has to say, at least a little bit of it, called Evaluating Relativism. So O'Grady ends his book with a discussion of good versus bad relativism. And in actuality, we get a kind of sight that O'Grady was never really against relativism really. He's actually very open to relativism. And you'll find out from my criticism, he's even presenting himself even more open to relativism than I would even like. But he's very relativistic if I think about it. You see, he says bad relativism is facile relativism. Relativism taken for social political reasons with little reflection or actual nuance in philosophy. And we will talk about this in the next video or the next episode when it comes to the kind of politics going on because it's really not as simple as you think. It's not just like a left-right kind of issue here. But also a problem with it, he says, is the relativists who just lump all different kinds of relativism they hear together and take it as one big package. It is as if one already agreed to themselves that they are relativists so immediately without actually looking at the various different kinds of relativism and how they interact or impact each other, just endorse and agree that all relativism everywhere must be so, to any maximal and unlimited degree. I mean, I personally know some people from sociology who say everything is relative but have never actually comprehended the possibility of deviant logics, let alone some forms of extreme relativism that can lead to solipsism, the denial of the other, or even Promethean anti-realism, which they would want to deny in ontology, so requiring a non-relative other component to provide a kind of restraint against that kind of position, which they wouldn't want. So if you have watched this series, there is more of a discussion in depth about the different forms of relativism and what they mean and how they impact each other than this facile relativist likely has ever even considered while simply lumping them all together with whatever else is relativistic that they can come across and endorse it to an unlimited degree. But more importantly, with that bad kind of relativism, is that it is a kind that defeats itself. So let me now just read a quote from that final evaluation of the bad form of relativism. What he says is, What is deeply problematic about bad relativism is that the views articulated are such as to undermine the very process by which they are articulated. That is, they serve to undermine the process of articulating positions, making arguments, and having rational debate. Generally, proponents of these views claim they challenge monolithic conceptions of position stating, arguing, and rationality. I have argued for core notions of these that must be adhered to. To go against them is to be caught in a dilemma. Either you argue for a new position and so in the very performance of that argument undermine yourself or else you carry on your idiosyncratic discourse but become isolated from the rest of the intellectual community, particularly from the sciences. So that's what I sometimes visualize as a fork, but it is that well-known dilemma being specifically and explicitly, <laughs> explicitly explicated here by Paul O'Grady in his final evaluation, which is therefore the, the limit of relativism that he wishes to restrict against. These versions of extreme relativism O'Grady calls bad are not all relativists or all versions of relativism, but a variety that takes a position against even any position taking. Like no one can say anything. But if so, that would include their own position as well and would commit them to self-defeat. Like how did you say that then? So it leaves in a position where they remain isolated if they're not committed to self-defeat because then they wouldn't be taking a position against taking a position, in which case those who do take positions will go unopposed anyway. I mean, they would want to say we're not denying anyone, we're accepting everyone, that's the difference. So no, we're not denying anything, but they absolutely do want to deny the absolutist at the same time. So we will talk about this more in the next episode, but the issue of self-defeat or incoherence, we actually see many, many, many examples of in this book alone. Never mind the many, many examples of situations pointed out in the other books and a huge plethora of philosophers accounted for in these books making the same points, just in the various different areas that extreme relativists go. So to make it easy, imagine like there's a stage 1 relativist who isn't aware that they are committing self-defeat. 
And maybe in response to becoming aware of that type of thing at stage two, they end up pulling terms, or step in as I called it. So they're not self-defeating, but then they don't seem to be aware that they have been effectively silenced, or that they are failing to engage when they do that. The stage three relativist, however, is well aware of both of these things, the self-defeat and the disengagement. And so they actually explicitly deny relativism but just happen to have philosophies that loan themselves to or support relativism anyway. For example, as they're called both by O'Grady and Phillips, the archetypical relativist, later naming Rorty and Putnam themselves, vigorously deny that they are relativists. Yes, please understand that the most prominent well-known as relativist, at least when it comes to actual philosophers, Rorty and Putnam, those who are by some philosophers considered as paradigmatically relativistic thinkers themselves take a moment to explicitly deny relativism, at least in the extreme sense, and both indicate it has to do with self-defeat. For example, on the very chapter on ontology, with one of the two noted ontological philosophers dealt with in that chapter, O'Grady says while speaking of Putnam, where the world known to us is dependent on our point of view, produces a very extreme form of relativism. His, Putnam's, argument against extreme relativism is simply that it is self-refuting. Remember, this is supposed to be coming from one of the two most well-known ontological relativists. If one claims that each perspective is equally valid, then that very view is just one among many perspectives, and it has no purchase on anyone else's position and may be safely ignored. So that last part pointing to the effective silence, or the lack of engagement then. So that was about Putnam, but when it comes to Rorty, in fact both Phillips and O'Grady share direct quotes from them right in the beginning of their books about this kind of issue. Phillips in particular points to this quote by Rorty himself, saying, if there were any relativists, they would be easy to refute, and the quotation follows showing that it has specifically to do with the self-defeating issue. One would merely use some variant of self-referential arguments Socrates used against Protagoras. So my visual is of a fork, of either being self-defeating or effectively silenced, but it's just a kind of circumstance, a peculiar situation that is known pretty much to anyone with some philosophical awareness, even to the most well-noted relativists themselves. And such an issue for the relativist of an extreme kind that thinks everything is relative has been known since ancient times. It's not just these big name relativists Rorty and Putnam. Phillips has actually a number of other examples of well-known as relativists themselves disavowing relativism, despite still having philosophies that nevertheless promote relativism. But those would be what I call the stage 3 relativists and above. As I was saying, the stage 2 and stage 1 don't seem to be either aware of the effect of silence, or even worse, don't seem to be aware of the looming potential for self-defeat. So Phillips actually quotes philosopher Mark O. Kent of an important question that's asked. But if relativism is universally acknowledged to be refuted, or even self-refuting, then why is there so much discussion of it? Phillips attempts in his book to explain what he calls relativism's seeming evergreen appeal, beyond the bounds of merely the philosophic classroom, where things like incoherence and self-defeat is taken as pretty much a death blow. Not to relativism itself everywhere, that would be incredibly naive, nobody's saying that but to the extreme relativism of an all-encompassing, limitless variety, which is what we're actually trying to challenge here. Not to deny that relativism is powerful and in various areas, even previously uncommonly thought areas, but just to mark out that it does have limits. Such limits of self-defeat and effective silence are well known and appreciated by philosophers in the classroom. But then, why does it still take hold, as Phillips says, even growing in control of so many other departments and institutions? Well, Phillips has a discussion of that and he's going to talk about that. Maybe we'll talk about that in our next episode if we cover him. But now, so when it comes to O'Grady actually, despite what it seems like in this whole book, he is actually happy to call good relativism all the relativism we can even possibly have at all. So long as it's not a relativism that threatens the possibility of supporting relativism. 
That's right. There is a maximal relativism, which O'Grady doesn't just say is okay, but supports. Just he's pointing out that it's not infinite because we do have to stop at the moment before it becomes dangerous, volatile. The moment before it becomes self-defeating. That's what he calls good relativism. That's the limit of this weapon. And so for him, good relativism is a kind of middle ground between a naive realist or dogmatist and extreme or radical skepticism. Taking a kind of middle ground invites political criticism on both sides that he, Kirk, and Phillips and others talk about. They're aware of it. There's some really scary political things happening. Stuff that I've been too afraid to talk about because this is not really supposed to be a political challenge. But political tribalism on both sides is powerful as to create intellectual barriers to approaching and understanding the philosophy at play here and how they interact. For example, the naive realist on the right side of this spectrum that I'm showing believes that the dichotomies spoken about in the beginning of this series like the fact-value dichotomy are just steadfast and evident and obvious. They simply have not yet taken a step forward in the philosophic awareness to see how these dichotomies have in fact failed, and yet they themselves claim to be well studied. And they claim that any opposition to this dichotomy is obviously irrational, and sometimes thought to be strictly politically motivated, and not actually based in philosophy and history and the actual familiarity with science. This is a terrible and ignorant characterization. On the other hand, on the left side of the spectrum that I'm showing, there is a terrible misstep which is a swing in the opposite direction. Thinking that the failure of these dichotomies, of which great for them they have taken a step further than the naive realist, but then jump to the conclusion that the failure of the dichotomy, say the fact-value dichotomy, means that everything is value, in a way kind of still endorsing the dichotomy, just showing that one side is denied. Well, we kind of saw this error when discussing Professor Code, who presumably in greater philosophic awareness takes a position that there is no dichotomy between absolute and relative, but that doesn't mean that everything is relative. It instead means that there can be both, a blend of the two. Stating that both sides are not completely exclusive of each other does not mean that we're exclusively endorsing one side. That's not what was meant by the failures of the dichotomies here. And certainly a blend is kind of what I sort of am advocating for if you grow in philosophical nuance here. Back on the other hand, pointing out things like the relatedness and deviant logics to the ignorant naive realist has them accuse you of being some extreme relativist claiming everything is relative in ways that leads to what is called in many places intellectual nihilism and intellectual corruption. But it's not corruption. It's just straight accuracy to history, philosophy, and science. Anyway, so I'm going to leave the conversation like that there. As you can tell, there's going to be a lot of complicated situations, including that classroom situation. Certainly somebody of a certain social and political persuasion may believe to be maximally tolerant and accepting they must believe everything is relative and may not therefore have actually reflected on how that very position may allow someone of the opposite social political persuasion to teach their orthodox religious beliefs of the sins of various minorities as if it were science. Because yeah, sure, it can be science if everything is relative, and all they would really need is for it to count as science because that's really the only thing barring them from teaching their indoctrination to your children in the science classroom. And so they may have not really thought about that kind of consequence. And there are more extreme examples based in actual reality that we can talk about when we get to Phillips. But this classroom example of trying not to be relative with what counts as science and trying to ensure that we can say what is and is not science in a more absolute way so that certain religious pseudoscience is kept out of the science classroom is also based on actual history. It is the McLean vs. Arkansas case, the very first episode I did on my channel. And if you'd like, you can watch that now and sort of complete the whole cycle, which you would have done. If you have completed the whole cycle till now, well, congrats, you're awesome. Certainly light years ahead of some people that haven't even watched the video properly, let alone the actual O'Grady series that directly had already addressed many of their concerns much prior, in whole videos even. 
It's kind of funny thing how some of us are willing to put more time and effort into criticizing something than we are actually to watching all of a thing properly. And here I thought I was saving people work in some sense of having to read all of O'Grady. But really that would be the most legit criticism if somebody actually read the book too. But if I can't say hey do the reading then like at least watch the videos. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. So I'm going to put my criticism of Paul O'Grady in the next video. Unlike them, I guess I have obviously gone very thoroughly through O'Grady's work. And that way you can also ignore my input by ignoring the next video if you don't want to hear it, if you don't want to hear my criticism or me talking about the powers of this philosophic eye or whatever. I want to thank all of my Patreons. Slick Pockets.